I'm going to take that as a no. All right, well, let's get started. Um, thanks again. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking about <clears throat> where we are with scholarly communication, scholarly assessment these days, um, why alternative metrics are important, and then we're going to put it all together and show you some live, uh, some live stuff as well. So the way we measure scholarship is, this, is the way we've done it for 50 years when uh, things were in print. I, I, as a researcher, I, I publish something in an article that is hopefully in a high-impact journal, and then I hope people subsequently cite my work in hopefully high-impact journals themselves or the same high-impact journal. Um, there's been, you know, a lot of, even though this is the way we've been doing it, we know there's a lot of problems with this, uh, but we still, you know, it's really all we've had, right? People cite themselves, editors make uh, researchers cite something from their publication, and really it's, it's turned the journal into the measure of, of impact, which is really too bad. And so uh, these, these containers that have made sense for uh, the print world publishing have taken sort of a life of their own and, and become substitute uh, measures of impact when really uh, it should be about the work itself, uh, regardless of whether, uh, whether it's related to a journal or not. And certainly the way research output is these days is it shouldn't have to be an article at all to, uh, to show scholarship. One of the main things that's a problem with citations are they lag. Uh, by the time I go through that rigorous process of getting published and have other people cite me, depending on the discipline, it can be three to five years uh, before I, I have an, a real idea about how, my, how many citations I'm going to get for my work. Uh, here's a real life example from earlier this year. A uh, researcher discovered an organ in Wales. It was uh, an interesting find and was even considered one of the top 100 articles of the year uh, in Discover Magazine, but still isn't even on uh, Web of Science's radar, right, zero citations. But clearly things are happening uh, with this in the meantime. So how do we find that uh, those metrics that we can use without waiting uh, an inordinate amount of time. After all, science is moving way too fast for that these days. So what's, what's happened with the online research is that uh, because it's online and networked, uh, there's this creation of, of what we call data exhaust. So a lot of places now show evidence of what's going on with a researcher's work. And, you know, to be honest, it hasn't, the, the business of doing research hasn't changed that much. It's just since it's online and we can peer into it, we can see things that we couldn't see before. Right? So things like bibliographic management systems such as Mendeley or Site You Like or places like that right, really take the, take the place of the big piles of articles on the desk that we've had in the past, right? the, the places I want to um, save something to that I may cite later. And, you know, scientists have all talked to each other, uh, but now some of these conversations we can peer into. Um, so it's exciting that way. It gives us a, uh, more of an, uh, of an overall look. And it's not just librarians and uh, others that are, that are saying, look, this, this uh, journal impact factor uh, is not enough. Um, researchers are uh, themselves realizing that it's it's not the best way to uh, uh, to measure themselves and one of the things that came out earlier this year is a declaration of research assessment uh, that was bubbled up from the researchers themselves and there's a funny picture on the right about uh, people making shirts that, that uh, say ditch the impact factor um, to support that and as I was saying the you know, the citations are part of it, but we're starting to be able to see 
and collect metrics from the full spectrum, just like uh, uh, <clears throat> where once we could only see visible light, now we can see the rest of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum uh, in different ways and use those to uh, measure things. And so while citations are going to remain important, they're certainly not the whole full story. I'm not sure how many librarians are on the line, um, but when Andrew and I started this company, um, my librarian friends would say, hey, it sounds like what you're doing is, is similar to Counter. And for those not familiar with Counter, it's a uh, standard way of uh, collecting usage statistics from the different places that libraries subscribe to publishers and uh, database providers and such, so that you can compare uh, downloads and, and support your collection. Um, and so what we're doing this article level metrics uh, is pretty much the opposite, right? Counter tells you how much your institution uh, uses the world's research. And what we're doing at Plum is how the world uh, uses your institution's research. So there's some overlap, but it's kind of a, um, you know, an, uh, an interesting angle on, uh, on looking at it a little differently. So give you an idea of what we're what we're going after. Um, we're really looking to build a graph of big data um, to track researchers around the world, all of their output, and the metrics associated with that. So these are just a couple numbers that uh, to use to kind of give you an idea about um, how big um, this thing is, is is going to be. So how are people using this, right? Well, if you're performing research, it gives you new data, right? You've, all, you've had in the past, here are the citations of my articles, and I'll still have that. But now I'll have more, more data um, to compete for grant dollars to, uh, to show uh, you know, what a, the impact of my work. Um, it also allows for new benchmarks. How, how am I doing against uh, in, for similar things for people my same research age, people in my department, people in my discipline? Uh, how, do I, how do I stack up against that? Uh, if you're funding research, the return on investment, very important. Uh, getting that and more data to know how the money you're spending on research is doing and for making future decisions, right? Are we doing better? Uh, you know, are we, are we getting the right researchers to do, um, to do the right grants? And for publishing research, and we consider institutional repositories to be in this category as well, um, how do you get value out of that? Um, how do you add value to show uh, the metrics are, are um, coming from your place and other place, can you retain or recruit authors? Uh, potentially, can you uh, recruit other journals? Here's a chart you may or may not have seen. It's uh, from the NIH in the U.S. That's the National Institutes of Health, a very, very big funder. Um, so as you can see, in the last 25 years, the uh, uh, 15 years, I should say, the um, applications have been going steadily up, and the dollars have been staying steady, and the success rate has gone down. See, last year the success rate for for grants there was under 20 percent. So very competitive, and that, of course that's true around the world um, with that. And from the Gates Foundation annual letter at the beginning of the year, same thing, right? They're looking at it. We're, we're, we're um, funding these grants. What are we getting at? How do we know? We need to be able to measure these so we know we're getting using the money in the best possible way. So I'll show you the, uh, the system in a little more detail. One thing to remember or to know is it's really important to be part of the research process you already have in place or you are, are working to have in place. So um, 
if you are tracking your research through certain methods, through CRIS system potentially, um, through Vivo, uh, institutional repositories, um, you don't want to change that. And uh, if you want to use something like Plum, you don't want to start from zero and start entering people's research from, from the bottom up. So it's important for us to be able to take those uh, systems, automatically import them into the Plum system, and then create outputs so that they're useful. So I'll show you the, uh, the dashboard you can look at that's uh, the, the native PlumX product. Um, but you can also use widgets or the uh, API itself to get back, uh, either back into the, the system you have or into another system that you like with the, uh, with the alternative metrics uh, available. So you hear this term alt metrics, alternative metrics, you also hear uh, article level metrics. Um, they're all they're all pretty similar, but this uh, alt, this idea of alt metrics <coughs> is really a subset of the metrics that you want to uh, provide. So we're familiar with citations. Um, we're also relatively familiar with usage, right? That's it, how many times has something been downloaded, uh, HTML download or PDF download? Um, but uh, there are other measures of usage as well, um, but we understand those. The, the alt metrics are really these other three categories. So uh, this notion of captures takes uh, usage one step farther. So um, I've read the article, or maybe I haven't, but I want to save it either for myself or somebody else for later. Right? And this is uh, the bibliographic management system. Uh, idea, but it also could be a favorite or um, a watcher on GitHub, for instance, or, you know, I'm following these people uh, because I want to come back and I want to follow this uh, research. So it's a different level of interaction uh, than something like usage and clickers. When we talk about mentions, we're talking about things like comments, reviews, articles about uh, research. Uh, so not only have I read the article, but now I'm, I'm going to step to comment on it or review on it. And that's a, that's a different uh, level of, of metric and, uh, and kind of stands alone as well. And then social media. Um, we group things like Twitter, Facebook, uh, Reddit, Google+, things like that together because these are very uh, unique too. One of the things we've we've seen since we've been working on this is uh, that the social media metrics tend to be very promotional uh, by and large. So but what I mean by that is people tend to uh, have their article published and they or their publisher or friend will tweet and say, hey, this article just got published, check it out. And people in the network will retweet it and you'll see those and uh, you'll see very similar things and there might be two or three different Tweet, retweet threads like that, um, but that's very, very much what happens. So it's it's really about getting the word out. And how many how many of those people have actually read the article, um, you know, is up up for debate. But it's really about getting the word out uh, on those for the most part. Now there are also there are also you know you'll you'll see exceptions. You'll see tweets of you know people discovering uh, new people that are interested in their work and things like that. That definitely happens. But when you look at the vast majority of of um, tweets in particular, you'll see that uh, you'll see that. But it's nice to know that uh, because you might be interested in that, right? The those uh, those metrics, you might really be wanting to know: Am I promoting my work well enough, or is my department promoting their work well enough? Um, if Jim's research uh, seems to be getting a lot more interaction, what is he doing that I'm not doing? Is it on the promotional side or is it not? Um, some really early research has been uh, done about correlations um, between tweets and uh, uh, feature citations. And the uh, latest stuff I've seen, which is a small, small set of uh, PubMed um, research, has shown that there's, there's not a correlation in some, some, um, uh, some occasions there's a negative correlation. Whereas 
these uh, these places that are more capture metrics tend to correlate. And from a from a general perspective, that that makes sense, right? This is this these are the places where people are saving and and looking out for stuff, and you know, a good portion of that stuff is going to end up um, being cited uh, by them. So it kind of makes sense that there's more of a correlation with the with the captures in social media, but very early, very early. So uh, we'll see how that goes. How's everybody doing? Okay, we talked a little bit about uh, that articles aren't the be all end all, right? And so even now at this, you know, where we are right now, we're already tracking over 20 types of artifacts and more and more are coming up all the time. And, and, and that's why we call them artifacts because it's not just articles, it's, it's all the things you see here and more that, uh, that people consider their research output and we want to track that. Um, for the sources of metrics, here we are. We like to we like to joke that we're uh, going to be A to Z very soon. Um, hopefully, when Zotero gets their API together, we'll we'll have that. But really, you can see a, a lot of different areas that we're already starting to track um, that washes over all the artifacts that we're tracking. So things like uh, Dryad and Figshare are are hitting the dataset world. GitHub and uh, SourceForge for uh, for code, um, you know things like patents and blogs, and uh, um, institutional repositories are there. Uh, also, Amazon and and WorldCat and Wikipedia um, for books and book chapters. So what I'd like to do now is just show a a, a diagram of of how this works. So here we have the artifacts and people that we're tracking. Right? That goes into the Plum data store. And on the other side, we've got these sources of metrics out there. And they go together too. When we put those together, we're, we're seeing where the, the graph is with between people and artifacts and the groups themselves. And by groups here, we're really flexible here. Um, on the first level, we want to talk about departments and labs and things like that, um, but this could just as easily be journals or issues or museums or custom collections, uh, different ways you want to group people um, uh, that make sense. So create that graph, you know, with ranking and analytics algorithms as well as uh, some identity resolution. And then that allows us to have different products on the other side. So directories and dashboards you'll see, uh, as well as widgets, um, APIs, and more. That's for the visual learners in the group there. So, so when I talk about widgets, uh, I'm talking about embedding uh, metrics in places that make sense. So here's a, here's a wizard for creating a, a, a widget for an artifact. So this could be an article or, or something that you're uh, putting on an institutional repository, for instance, it could be a publisher website, it could be a uh, department website about the group level uh, to do that. Um, it could also be an author level, so if you've got an author page as well. So I'm going to switch over and show you some live stuff on Plum X. Everything I'm showing you here is publicly available. Um, so you could essentially follow along at home. Uh, this is an, uh, an example of an artifact page. So right away you can see that this happens to have uh, metrics from the five categories, right? And you can see them. Uh, of course, they're all um, they're linked, so you can see uh, those bit.ly clicks, for instance. You can see the Wikipedia links that mention this article, um, and then. That also adds an, an element of discovery too. So, who are these Mendeley readers that are uh, looking at tracking this article and groups? Um, one thing I should mention here is you see Twitter twice, right? You've got two tweets and 47 tweets. What's happening there is that people are tweeting two different versions of uh, of this. So, 
know, they, some people might be tweeting uh, the DOI, some people might be tweeting the URL, it could be a different version. Uh, so that's happening there. And that's important to know. One, what are all the different versions that people are talking about, right? And I want to know them all, but I also want to know which ones are working uh, for me, right? This this version that's, that's hitting 47 tweets um, seems to be getting a lot more play than this one, right? So uh, if there's a difference, let's make sure that I'm uh, – uh, I'm, I'm putting my stuff there rather than there potentially, right? So it's nice to be able to look at this uh, this data and see uh, see things that, that you know might help you out in the future before this. And here's this embed widget thing to get to where the uh, thing I showed before uh, to get you there. And you can always get to the you know, PubMed version or the DOI version or uh, other versions that we have will be uh, uh, available so you can cl click to and see see that article itself. <clears throat> um, here's an article from a, an open access publisher in, in uh, Chile. Um, this is the dashboard where they can see uh, that article. In fact, if you go um, a step higher, They can see all the articles. Um, they can narrow by sections or volumes. Uh, since it's, it's a mega journal, they only have the one journal. And uh, if they didn't, if they had 10 or 12 journals, you could also narrow by those journals or issues. Um, so if you did want to see, you know, the different volumes here, you can see how the uh, latest volume is doing. Right so here's all the articles within that volume and, and the uh, metrics we're tracking on it as well. Now, if you go to the actual site, though, this is Medwave site, and I've gone to that article we were just looking at, um, and I've clicked on the metrics tab, and you see these same metrics, right, at, that are being called right at this time from our service uh, into here. So it allows them to show what they've gone. I mean, they can always show their full text views, right, but all this other stuff uh, there, they can um, now show to their, uh, to their users and their authors. Uh, another example of a widget in action, this is the University of Pittsburgh's DSpace um, repository. And as you go down, you can see that this is embedded in, in their site as well. And this is updated from the metrics we got uh, today on this. Um, and once again, here's the same article in the Plum system. Once again, we talked about the, the uh, different versions. Here you can really see this article we're tracking three different versions of um, PubMed Central, 138 views. Uh, the institutional repository is getting 34. And then PLOS, on the PDF views anyway, 219. Right, so if you're the author, this is something you wouldn't have been able to get before this, right, is knowing, well, it really is, you know, I kind of expected not as many people to uh, go to the repository to see that article, but, you know, a good amount do, that's do, that's, that's good, I'll, I'll make sure I put my stuff in the repository again next time, right, um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting, the difference, a lot of people are reading this on PLOS. Uh, I'll make sure that, uh, you know, that's something I'm getting from PLOS that I may not be getting from on my other articles from commercial providers. Um, this site here is plu.mx slash Smithsonian. Uh, this is the top level of, uh, of the research output we're tracking for the Smithsonian. Um, at the top of the page, you'll notice here we have a summary, so the top five things, uh, different kinds of artifacts we're tracking, and then up to the top five things we're tracking in the five categories. And if you click on those, you can filter down um, and see only those, right? Uh, I mentioned you can narrow by museums. 
there you are. The Smithsonian, of course, carries cares about which museums uh, are which, and you can uh, drill down in there. You can also drill down by researchers, uh, show them all. Um, and the t the tabular view, right? By you know, there's a lot of data here, and this is a, one of the reasons we had these these categories to handle, you know, to make it easier to uh, peruse these uh, these metrics. So if you want to explode one of these, you can, you know, see all the all the stuff with the uh, social media. You can, or if you want to select metrics that that are, you know, you only care about. I want to see usage and I want to see tweets. You can do this and you can apply this at, at either the uh, institution level, the museum level, the researcher level, right? See these and then you can um, send that up to uh, Excel if you want, work, work on it offline. Uh, that's good crunch the numbers in a way that, that makes sense to you. So here's a researcher profile. Uh, the same carousel up here to, to be able to drill in um, to what he's what he's doing. Uh, you still see the tabular view. Um, besides the five categories to make it easy, one other thing that we you know think is very important is to provide visualizations of this data to make it more accessible. Um, and our first visualization is a sunburst. So you can see that's it's pretty dense, right? Tony has a lot of uh, output, a lot of presentations, a lot of different kinds of stuff. So uh, as we go around, uh, Tony's in the middle. This next ring out are the types of things we're tracking for him. Then the titles of those in here. And the little, <laughs> the little slices of pie here are the places we're gathering metrics. And finally, out here are the metrics themselves. The reason these are these are different is things like, you know, Facebook. You can have likes and shares, uh, plots, for instance. You have uh, many different kinds of metrics. Um, so the scenario here is either I'm Tony or I'm I'm looking at Tony for the first time, and what what's going to bounce out, right? You see something like this where everything's even, you don't know where to start, right? If, I, if I'm coming across Tony, I'm not sure, but if, but if I change the access to impact, different slices um, come out. So things like this guy, for if I want to see an article by Tony, right? These two articles um, are bust out from the others. Um, and from a presentation uh, standpoint, this, this guy, look, has got 4,600 slide share views. Right. These are the places I might start, and if I'm Tony, I might uh, get an idea about, of all my work, what is out there that's that's uh, gathering impact, and does that make sense, and why is this thing uh, getting more impact than maybe something else that I thought maybe should have? Is it something I did? Is it something about the work itself? It starts, you know, getting you down this road of, uh, of different stories to, to be able to ask. Now, how do we create a profile for someone like Tony? Um, we've added all these links, right? He has a lot of profiles around the web, and and uh, as you see, right here, you can get to different places. So if you wanted to get to his Google Google citation page, you can, right, and many other places. This could be his, uh, you know, his home page on his on his faculty website, things like that, his his blog, etc. Um, but as I was saying, we want to make it as easy as possible. So if he wanted to, he could upload a BibTeX file from any any number of services like Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic Search, or even Scopus or um, Web of Science to get started. Um, if you all are familiar with ORCID, it's an author ID system that's uh, that's gaining starting to gain a lot of traction. Somebody has an ORCID ID, uh, they can just enter it here, and we'll go out and uh, gather all the, the related output that's, in, that's associated with that ORCID ID and put it together. 
Uh, we had a researcher come on a couple months ago, ask us to build a profile. He gave us an ORCID ID, a picture, and a SlideShare ID, and he had his profile up in about two minutes. Um, if people are using DPress, uh, we automatically import the uh, profiles from uh, from that uh, as well. A uh, list of DOIs you can use, PubMed IDs, uh, patents here. Um, somebody's got a clinical clinical trial. Uh, we can start tracking that. And then things like SlideShare, Vimeo, YouTube, uh, places where people are uploading themselves, um, you know, presentations or uh, or classes on their research, and want to track that, they can. Most of those places ha have uh, channels. So if a researcher is using a channel for uh, uploading their research output to one of these services, they can just put their ID in here and we'll continue to track new stuff as well. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, happened with Tony in particular is that he discovered he his YouTube was not uh, all his research. So we, we I uh, needed to add his YouTube to one of his, uh, his individual videos here to, to be tracked. And for him, that that told him, you know what, I need a dedicated uh, YouTube research channel because uh, that's going to help me in the future for stuff like this. So as, even as working through it as, at this level, uh, gives some researchers, you know, uh, uh, insight into what and how they're doing and how they're. Uh, um, Communicating in scholarly but scholarly realm. Uh, for books, if you know ISBNs or OCLC numbers um, for your books, um, you put them in here, and we'll we'll track those for you. Um, to be clear, with uh, with WorldCat, um, it's a it's the largest union catalog uh, in the world. And so we can tell how many libraries, academic libraries in, in general, have, have purchased that book. Um, and that's a nice, nice new measure that people really haven't had uh, before. Uh, I was in a workshop last week, and um, most of the people in the workshop were humanity, so they were, they were putting in their ISBNs. And the race was really on to see who, who, whose book was in more libraries, as well as close libraries, too, right? or, or the furthest library away. Um, so it was interesting to see, see researchers see that for the first time. Um, other things we can add here, um, also straight URLs. Uh, Tony created this site, uh, ScientistDB. It's basically a uh, Wikipedia for scientists. And, uh, and it looks to track how that's doing. Um, because that's his, his creation. Uh, but this could be his blog. Uh, it could be a PDF that uh, has a URL on, on your faculty website, something else you want to track. Uh, one of the interesting things we're doing at the University of Pittsburgh is uh, using this field to send queries into their institutional repository uh, to create the output for authors. So as as new output gets uh, logged into the institutional repository, we know about it and uh, we'll query that again and, and add it to the output and, and start measuring it. So it's an automatic way of, uh, of tracking that output using the, the URLs in the D space, by the way. So I'm going to come up for air just for a second. Um, any questions on what we just saw? You guys are being so kind and nice. All right. So What's next? I tried to give you an idea about why we're doing it, what we're doing, how we're doing it. Um, if you'd like to see for yourself, um, plu.mx is the is the URL. You can uh, uh, cruise around and do many of the things that I just showed you. I mean, our our normal website is Plum Analytics, and there's a blog there. That's probably the the uh, uh, best way to keep up with uh, what we're doing. I try to post uh, two or three times a week. Um, 
If you want to get art article level metrics for an institutional repository, let us know. Um, for researcher dashboards, uh, the way we work there is uh, is a subscription based on the number of researchers we track. If you want to try it, um, we can do a free trial and, and set up up to five researchers so that you can see researchers that you're familiar with in the system. We'd be happy to do that. Um, if you're doing some journal uh, publishing, uh, you can do that as well. And the next thing we're uh, rolling out are, are going to be dashboards that track uh, uh, specific grants, um, so you can see that. Um, here they are again. I'll leave this up. My email is at the top there. Um, by all means, let me know uh, if you have any questions after this. Um, but we've got a little time uh, for questions right now, if, if you have any. Okay, well, um, thank you. Like I said, we're we'll, uh, we're in touch. Um, hey, Mike, we have one a... question that just got typed in here. Okay, great. Um, from Barbara, I'm not sure if people are having a hard time actually being heard, other than the two of us. Um, it, it certainly seems like by the names on the list, they're they're not that quiet of people. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, um, is Researcher ID one of the options for your scholar profile? Right now, researcher ID isn't, but something we, um, oh, thanks, there it is. Um, but researcher IDs are, uh, are being rolled into ORCID, and it is something we, uh, we want to add, and that's, an, that's a great example of exactly the kind of things we want to add that, that make sense to people to make it easy. So right now, it's not in the product you saw it, uh, but it is something we'd like to get in there. I'm still getting used to this software, so I apologize for if I'm blocking some of the screen there. It looked like somebody else asked another question. Yeah, no, it's all good. People just saying they, they don't have questions. Okay, great. Um, like I said, feel free to contact us anytime, and I really appreciate the time you, uh, you took to, to listen to us today. Uh, have a nice rest of your day, folks, and take care. Bye, everybody.